And we would like to welcome Dr. Denny. Many of you may know already, but Dr. Uh, Josh Denny has been involved with all of us research programs since its inception. He was a member of the advisory committee to the NIH Director Precision Medicine Initiative Working Group, which developed the program's initial scientific blueprint. He then led the program's initial prototyping project and the All of Us Data and Research Center. Dr. Denny was named as the CEO of the All of Us Research Program in January 2020. The NIH All of Us Research Program is part of an effort to advance individualized health, healthcare by enrolling 1 million or more participants to contribute their health, health data over many years, the program aims to reflect the diversity of the United States and to include participants from groups that have been underrepresented in health research in the past. Today, this presentation and following conversation will describe the current landscape of precision medicine and genomic research, identify gaps in data and participation among populations underrepresented in biomedical research and strategies to increase diversity, describe health-related research results in pharmacogenetics and hereditary disease conditions being generated by all of us and potential impact to healthcare providers, and recognize the kinds of data available on the All of Us Researcher Workbench and the opportunities available to researchers to leverage this data to advance scientific research, including current activities underway at Mayo Clinic. Throughout this talk, please use uh, Slido to submit your questions. We have planned time for Q&A at the end of the session. If you're joining us um, online and have not yet claimed continuing education credit, a message will be sent out in, that, in this uh, chat shortly. If you are in person and would like to uh, claim credit for today, please either uh, register online or look at the credit information posters uh, near the entrance. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Denny. Well, hello and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Mayo has been a wonderful partner for all of us and uh, as a program and have many friends here uh, from prior work as well. Uh, I'm going to give a brief uh, introduction to the All of Us Research Program, and then we'll go through a Q&A program, um, which I really look forward to. You know, as, as a foundation here, um, uh, we have learned so much, and medicine has been so transformed by what we've learned from observational longitudinal cohort studies, embedded clinical trials, and these kinds of things have really helped us uh, advanced knowledge. And one that, you know, every physician knows, I remember learning about in medical school is the Framingham uh, Heart Study, which began in 1948. This is uh, some screenshots from its first publication in 1961, and really helped us learn some foundational things about blood pressure, exercise, smoking, um, uh, combined with other resources, have really helped us identify interventional risk factors that can help us improve health. And concomitantly with that, we've seen a decrease in cardiovascular mortality, uh, uh, 50 to 70% over the ensuing decades of programs like that. And, you know, there's been much that's been said about precision medicine. Um, I, as a practicing internist, when I was at Vanderbilt before moving to NIH, uh, we did efforts in, in implementing around pharmacogenomics and some disease risk variants. But one of the real challenges is understanding how diversity applies, or sorry, how genetics applies to diverse populations. And you can see this is why. The vast, vast majority of genomic research that's been done worldwide has been on people of European ancestry, with over 90% of individuals uh, in all genome-wide association studies coming from European uh, ancestry. And so that has real impacts. The top figure here says that, you know, some of these variants that we think are pathogenic for diseases like uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or other uh, conditions such as that may actually be very common in other populations and thus not pathogenic. And also a newer thing is these ideas of polygenic risk scores to predict risk for cardiovascular disease, diabetes, other things like this, taking into account up to millions of genetic variants those don't necessarily work when you translate to other populations as well. 
And so the mission of the All of Us Research Program is to accelerate health research and medical breakthroughs, enabling individualized prevention, treatment, and care for all of us. We really want to begin with the idea of nurturing relationships longitudinally with the diverse population of a million or more individuals that we will follow for decades um, uh, that reflect the diversity of the United States. Um, uh, we want to take this resource that participants contribute to, make it available to as many researchers in a safe and secure way that we can. And then we want to catalyze an ecosystem of researchers, funders, and uh, communities to participate and really help make this resource as valuable as we can. We link these to a set of core values that we began the program with. It starts with participation being open to anyone in the United States. Uh, we want to reflect the rich diversity of the United States. Importantly, participants are partners. And this is something we've said from the beginning is our, we really don't think of this as you know, research subjects. We think of partnership with participants longitudinally with the program. And that's so important that we are transparent, we are authentic, um, uh, we give participants access to information. And those kinds of things as we think about moving forward, about making their data accessible, making change uh, in a secure uh, way. And you know, I want to highlight this last one about being a positive catalyst for change and research, because I think we see that. We don't talk about research subjects nearly as much, and we think about returning information to participants, how we can return value to people um, uh, in other research projects we do. And I think these are becoming part of the fabric of what we want to do as a country. Anyone can join all of us from across the country. Despite, no matter how you come in, we share the same in common elements. It's a common consent process, it includes a sharing of electronic health record information, sets of surveys, physical measurements, bio samples, which are, you'll hear, are stored here at Mayo as our biobank and building one of the world's largest biobanks. Uh, and then things like mobile technologies. You can come in through the web. We have smartphone apps. This is a screenshot of um, the app on my phone. And uh, you can link in your electronic health record through patient portals. Electronic health records are also donated by some of our uh, healthcare provider organizations on behalf of the participant. We have launched nationally in 2018. We have over 630,000 participants that have joined the program. People contribute in different ways. Some have things like Fitbits that they share into the program. Others uh, will link in electronic health records. Um, uh, we collect bio samples. And if we haven't always been able to reach the entire country to collect things like bio samples, and now we can. During COVID, we created technologies. We uh, made new partnerships that let us really reach the entire country to donate biospecimens in different ways. We've met really focused on engaging diverse populations, and you can see the race and ethnicity of our participants there. About half of our participants identify as non-white or non-Hispanic. Um, uh, and uh, if you think about the larger categorization of underrepresented in biomedical research, we really think of it much broader than just race and ethnicity. It's things like age of consent. It's where you live. So rural location um, is an uh, underrepresented category, uh, gender identity and sexual orientation, educational attainment. And one of the ones we added most recently was disability. So, you know, this gets at the longitudinal nature of our program because we didn't initially ask those questions. Um, so we introduced them later in the program and we did a catch up module to identify people that have disabilities. And we expect that we'll continue to do this over time. We began the program with engagement studios across the country, asking questions like, what would be valuable for you? What does precision medicine mean? And we found out that precision medicine doesn't necessarily mean itself uh, a lot to people. Things like individualized medicine and you know, our name, all of us come from some of the engagement we did with our participant partners. What they told us they went back and what would be valuable to them, first and foremost, was genetic information. But then there's lots of other kinds of things that they're interested in. Uh, the majority of people said health is much bigger than things like ancestry and non-health traits uh, when you think about genetics. But we return all these kinds of information to our participants um, and uh, you know, talk some about the genetics piece. Um, uh, we uh, return essentially uh, health, uh, sorry, disease risk genetic reports and also pharmacogenetic reports, which we call medicine in your DNA to our participants. About 96% of participants will have an actual finding in a pharmacogenetic report if they, of course, have exposure to the medication of interest. Um, about two to 3% of people have actionable results in hereditary disease risk reports, uh, much like you would expect from other populations. These numbers seem fairly consistent. Uh, it's early in days of this, but across um, different populations as well. We recently released a new uh, data set in April of this year. This 
includes over 200 or right around 250,000 whole genome sequences, making us the currently the largest uh, whole genome uh, resource available um, uh, in the world that's broadly accessible for research. Of course, this data set is 45% uh, of people not from European ancestries. So that really adds to the global diversity as an, as an available resource. And you can see the other kinds of things in here. We've been increasing our Fitbit data there. We released here uh, sleep data. 15,000 may seem like a small number compared to the magnitudes of other things we're talking about, but that's actually a very large data set. And we'll come at the end a little bit to that, as well as we're starting to generate long read sequences as well, which um, uh, get a better idea of some of the more difficult areas to genotype in the genome. And some of you are very familiar with that, I'm sure. Um, researchers use the resource through a cloud-based uh, um, uh, resource. This is the researcher workbench. It's a passport access model. So researchers from institutions that, have, um, uh, that are signed onto the program can rapidly get access to the program, go through trainings on human subjects and uh, how to use all of us. And it's currently open to any uh, US-based academic or healthcare or nonprofit um, institution. This gives you some sense of the use of the researcher workbench. We have over 5,300 uh, researchers using it now um, since launch in 2020. Um, the growth of that has really been uh, fast compared to what we expected it to be, which is uh, great for us. Um, the publications lag, as, as you can imagine, but we already have over 160 publications. And you can see that we have a number of researchers from Mayo Clinic already using it. And let me use this opportunity to encourage more of you um, uh, to come in and use the research uh, resource. Um, this is a open resource. When people come on, you get initial free credits to use the resource if you're a new researcher there. And you can see a number of different kinds of things that are being studied uh, on the platform. We have over 500 organizations that have signed up. Um, we really focus, just like with participants, on under-resourced institutions, so non-R1s, uh, HBCUs, Hispanic-serving institutions, other minority-serving institutions. We also have seen a number of nonprofits join, including uh, patient advocacy groups, things such as that, which bring um, uh, other communities that may not typically engage in research. Uh, you can see at Mayo, there's 42 researchers. Researchers, I hope you know through the next week or so we can increase that number. 50% um, are underrepresented by a medical work, uh, workforce, and you can see in general um, uh, that we're looking at the race and ethnicity of our researchers, just like we were participants, and we're doing programs specifically to help uh, on ramps for researchers into the program and to learn how to use it. So I want to give you one example. Of, of the importance of diversity here and, and, and what it could look like. And many of you probably are familiar with the April 01 uh, variants that are um, of African ancestry that are responsible for up to 70% of kidney disease in people of African ancestry. And so if you look at the UK Biobank, which is a huge resource, and do um, uh, surveys for associations on that, you can see that really nothing is, is particularly strong in that association. Nothing there is crossing the bond for any correction. But um, uh, a, a um, postdoc um, uh, in my research lab uh, did the same analysis in the old data set from all of us, 98,000 people, of which 24,000 were of African ancestry. And you can see dramatic signals of, of you know, renal failure like you expect to see. Um, and so, you know, it's just the, a lot of the, the population not being so uh, commonly present in some of the big resources can lead for very strong effects not being seen if they're population specific. So the number of publications uh, are coming out in a routine way. Um, uh, I will, um, uh, these are available. This is one from the Mayo Clinic looking at a phenome-wide association study, looking at different categorizations of smoking use. And so in this case, if you look at, you know, uh, younger age smokers on the far right compared to uh, longer uh, term smokers and, and panel A, you see some slightly different panels of uh, associations. You see commonalities, but the strength of some of those based on age, uh, based on uh, whether you quit or not, um, reveals, can reveal some things about, you know, the nature of smoking um, in this kind of approach. And uh, similarly with this is a study look, looking at the Fitbit data and looking at diseases that are associated over time with number of steps per day. So incident diagnoses uh, following in a time varying way, those number of steps uh, that you take. And so as we are not surprised, walking more or running, those kinds of physical activity are protective of many diseases. As a primary care doc, one of the things I love about it on the right is that you could see that, you know, 
you don't necessarily have to get to 10,000. Uh, going from 1,000 to 2,000, 2,000 to 4,000, and you know uh, that curve bends around 8,000 steps per day is protective against many different diseases. And so having this res rich resource that gets into things like activity monitors and electronic health records and genomics allows us to get into different kinds of uh, analyses. So right now, over 457,000 people have biospecimens stored at uh, the Mayo Clinic Biobank that maps onto 3 million tubes and uh, nearly 12 million aliquots um, uh, on the way to more than 30 million, I, I, I hear, um, uh, as we finish out this cohort. And uh, you know, I'd say finish because I don't know that we'll necessarily ever stop. I hope this keeps going and building over time, but that will get us to our million. And we recently launched a large ancillary study on top of the program called Nutrition for Precision Health, which is throwing other kinds of biospecimens into the Mayo Clinic as well. So uh, with that, I'm ready to move on to our next thing. Um, thank you so much for that intro. Thank you, Dr. Danny, for an excellent beginning to today's Grand Rounds. So we will now move uh, on to the second part of today's event, and we would like to welcome Dr. Dupra to the stage, who will be moderating the final uh, conversation and Q&A. This conversation will be included in the podcast series, Genes and Your Health, which is also moderated by Dr. Dupra. Dr. Dupra is a consultant in community internal medicine and the associate uh, director for education for, uh, for the Center of Individualized Medicine at Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota. Again, as a reminder to our audience, uh, we will be using Slido for the Q&A, uh, and you can find the Slido link uh, on your Zoom uh, link. Again, thank you, Dr. Denny, and uh, we would like to welcome Dr. Dupra. The, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Dr. Denny, I wanna welcome you as well. Um, this is a real pleasure for me to be able to sit across from you and talk about this really cool stuff. So as mentioned, I do moderate the podcast, Genes in Your Health, and it's fascinating to me. My training is as a uh, MD, internal medicine doctor, and as a pharmacologist. And so my initial entree into this was in pharmacogenomics. And um, I've learned an awful lot as I've gone through this about the whole field of genomics in general. So I gave Dr. Denny a few questions ahead of time and he covered a lot of the information in his talk, but I'd like to go ahead and explore a little bit more about that. So one of the big criticisms about genomic research and individualized medicine has always been that it's been very homogenous. Northern European, I think your slide showed greater than 90%. And your work is really critical in terms of learning more. So can you talk more about how you're diversifying and how are you getting all of these diverse individuals to participate? Thank you so much. And again, thank you for this. It's wonderful to have a chance to talk with you and continue this dialogue. You know, it starts with engagement and uh, we, before we recruited anyone, before we wrote a consent, before we uh, decided what our questionnaires would be and certainly what our the program name would be, um, we began with engagement studios with uh, 16 different populations that we identified that were underrepresented and did community engagement studios in uh, 17 different cities, um, uh, 77 total uh, of those. And then we did surveys as well, complemented with ongoing involvement with participants in every level of governance, in every committee, uh, subcommittee, uh, we have boards, you know, uh, across the program, we have a lot of participant uh, input or, you know, potential participant input um, uh, of to help guide us what we were doing. We thought, you know, in the beginning when we were writing this and, and thinking about this, even back to 2014 and 15, um, it really was a scientific imperative um, uh, and a social imperative to uh, diversify uh, this research. And, you know, uh, you've probably noticed in following this as well, and many of you in this field, the numbers actually haven't gotten better over time. In some cases, they've actually gotten worse um, uh, because of the availability of such big, rich resources that are not diverse, that have been transformative for science. And so we wanted to complement those with one that would be diverse and really think broadly about what kinds of diversity we want to capture 
race and ethnicity as as one proxy for ancestry and genetic background is one, but then there's so many other components of that that we thought were so key to help get a more complete picture. Things like social determinants of health and and ongoing reassessments to because obviously health changes over time. All these things will be really critical. There's a related question that came in from the audience as well, which is. So you mentioned the importance of race and ethnicity, not only of the patients, but also of the researchers. Can you talk a bit more about why this is so important? I'm so glad uh, you asked that question. Uh, you know, part of it is almost a promise to our participants that, um, uh, that they want to see uh, their communities represented in the researchers, but also I think it's just really important for science. We know better science is done by diverse populations. The more diverse members of the team, you can even look at things like citation uh, per journal as well. There's so many different ways of looking at this and studies have been done to show that we do better science and uh, have more impact with diverse teams um, and ask better and more questions of the data. So, you know, it's, it's a, um, the access of the data is a limitless resource, essentially, in terms of it's just compute time on a resource. And so, you know, when we can do that in a secure and safe way and then educate, we will, you know, broaden hopefully the biomedical workforce and be part of that uh, greater question uh, because, you know, in general, science is not very diverse um, in this country and we would like to help um, uh, broaden that. So I'm a clinician and I have patients who say, I signed up for this study. They want to know what the information are they going to get. So when you're getting whole genome, what kind of reports and what kind of genomic information are they going to get back as participants? And is it automatic? Do they sign up for it? What happens on the end of these participants who engage in the research? It is uh we have a couple different layers of information that people can get back from genetics. The first report that we launched was more of an engagement resource. It's ancestry and non-health related traits. So you can see continental and subcontinental ancestry. Uh, you can see things like uh, whether you can taste cilantro or what kind of earwax you have, the kind of engaging uh, traits that we're familiar with um, from some commercial com companies. And then health related was one that we built based on the whole genome sequences that delivers on uh, health disease risk of 59 genes and common conditions such as hereditary cancers, uh, some cardiovascular conditions, um, and and uh, things like hyperlipidemia, um, uh, and then also another report for pharmacogenetics. Both of these are reports that we've carefully developed and tested with diverse audiences, um, uh, th thinking about things like reading level, worked with the FDA. We have an um, investigational device exemption with the FDA and really worked with them as being the first program really of its kind to do this kind of thing at the scale and, and the way it's being delivered directly to participants. Participants get to choose whether they want these reports back. Um, we really felt like, and participants told Told us uh, they wanted to get the report back and they wanted to have a choice and and you know we see patients that uh, participants that don't want the reports back um, as well and uh, uh, and then we have genetic counselor support for everything uh, mm -hmm. English and Spanish speakers and then language line support for 200 languages um, uh, in the process and so those genetic counselors available if you just want to talk about your genetic ancestry um, as well as you know your pharmacogenetic reports. And I know that genetic counselors really have been um, a, a, a limit. And I know that there's a shortage nationwide of genetic counselors, which has been a problem. Uh, oftentimes when you get, have a patient in your office and there is a concern, um, I'm a strong believer that genetic counselors should be meeting with my patients if they want to get their own genetic testing, because it's not a yes or no, it's a probability. And that's a hard thing for a primary care clinician to talk about with a patient, you know, your test is positive or negative, but that doesn't mean you won't get cancer. And that's foreign for a lot of them. So if you get a test back and the patient comes back and says yes, or it says no, is that something then that they need to come to me as a clinician and get verified by a Mayo test or are they done? Our tests, by virtue of working our, our relationship with the FDA, are research results, and they say that very much so on the report. If you have a hereditary disease risk positive uh, report, meaning that you have one of these 59 genes that you have a pathogenic variant in, uh, we, uh, if you want it, 
we have available and the program pays for a confirmatory clinical test. And so you can take that test directly to um, uh, a provider. Uh, on the pharmacogenetics side, we don't have that available. Um, uh, and, and you, of course, could decide to do um, uh, a separate test um, in that process. Thank you. So from a patient standpoint, what does an individual patient get out of it? Truly the individualized medicine, but then on the bigger scale, what's the good for the population health? Those are, you know, wide ranging questions, but. They really are. Um, you know, when we started this and we asked, what is the value to you, to participants at that point before the program began? So potential future participants, you know, 91% said it really was around the good that we could discover for communities like theirs. Um, and so most people have that as a big part of why they're joining, that they would join because of the value, the future discovery, the medications that will, you know, sort of uh, be relevant or tested or discoveries that could be made, the genetic interpretations that could be made, et cetera, on populations like theirs um, and understanding of that. But then it's also about the value we can return and things like these genetic test results. These would be very expensive tests clinically um, uh, if you wanted to get them. And they're not necessarily widely available. Um, and we have general counselor support and all that kind of stuff to help walk you through it. That is a potential very real health benefit to someone. You know, my own uh, pharmacogenetic results, uh, I have variants in um, CYP2C19, which processes clopidogrel, uh, or Plavix and other drugs, as well as SLC01B1, which um, is involved with uh, simvastatin. And you have a, a great, much greater risk of toxicity with simvastatin with those variants. And you know, those are two things actually I spent a lot of time on studying um, at Vanderbilt. So it's, it's it's very personally relevant. Obviously, I didn't know that beforehand, um, and that's you know new knowledge from my uh, test. So you know, those stories can be things that become very relevant um, uh, if you encounter those health trajectories. But we start as a research program, and that's why most people join um, uh, is as a research program. Right, and Kay told me the same thing about the a gene and that extreme my simvastatin myalgia. So I get that. That becomes near and dear to your heart when you can't go up the stairs very easily. Um, so one of the questions that came up is, so what are the biggest challenges that the program faces as it aims to continue to add more ancillary studies, more participants to the already reach, rich resource? We, um, uh, you know, our biggest challenges ahead of us, and, and one of our primary goals is continue to grow the resource. And one thing I didn't talk about, but a really big goal that we're working on now is launching a pediatric program. So right now you have to be 18 or over to join the program. Now, interestingly, because people share medical records, we have more than 20,000 virtual kids, kids, uh, people that have shared medical records, sometimes all the way to birth. Uh, that, you know, we're just part of their, their electronic health records and people have already published uh, pediatric stories based on those. Uh, but, you know, we want to build uh, at least one of the world's largest, if not the largest pediatric cohort as well, to answer these same kinds of questions in a diverse population. So building the pediatric cohort is a big thing out of us. And then we are really starting these diversity of, of co um, sort of ancillary studies, which build on us as a platform. Nutrition for Precision Health, which I mentioned, is, is looking at diet in three controlled, um, uh, we'll have controlled feeding studies um, uh, where people take prescribed diets to study in a randomized way, what the impact on the diet is and things like the microbiome, metabolomics, other things like that, applying machine learning approaches, new ways to assess diet, which could be then applied from you know the small development cohort, which is actually a huge cohort for this kind of study of 10,000 people, to our full 1 million. Uh, as we develop ways to take a picture of your meal and, you know, know something about what's in that. So um, uh, those are things that are really exciting, but, you know, uh, we are still developing how to build that as a capacity. And, uh, and, and right now we've just generated genetics. We have lots of other biosamples. How do we use those? So we have a lot ahead of us. We are, we are still in our beginnings. So privacy is the largest concern that one of the folks asked about regarding participating in the study. So what is the program doing to ensure that participant data is kept top secret? Privacy is really job one. We have to maintain trust with our participants and we have to make sure that participants know that their data will be used wisely. Um, uh, they also want us, they join because they want us to discover. And so we have to do that. But you know, what's cool is by having a platform like ours, 
we can actually make access safer for participants and actually easier and faster and more democratized for researchers. So let me say why. So one of the things is, so we bring all the data through a data and research center, the data are de-identified. Uh, those data are put into this resource and then people use the resource only within our cloud. So uh, they can be audited, they can be monitored, there are alerts if they try to do things like download. Um, uh, all those things are, you know, it's a safer environment in addition, of course, uh, being an approved researcher and you know what the projects are. And then we try to be transparent with our participants because they can at any point see what research projects are going on. And we actually get scenarios where participants ask a question on a research study and we have a resource access board that monitors the process. In addition, there's also the, just the general information security part of that. We have uh, third party providers, we have a white hat hackers to test the system and try to break in and help us you know, learn things to make it safer. We continuously monitor um, and really have best in class um, uh, security that we try to put in, in place. And then just be honest, you know, we want to make sure that people know if something does happen and we don't, we don't have a promise, but we certainly are going to do everything we can do to protect their data as best we can. So as a research study, then the data, genomic data, then does not feed and populate their EMR, because one of the cautions I've heard from patients, particularly is, I don't want to get that data because I don't want it in my EMR because of the implications for future insurability for long-term care insurance, for additional life insurance policies. So how does that work with participants in the study? So the first thing is when people go through and decide whether they, they uh, want a genetic result back or not, is we do educate on this. What are the potential risks? And we talk about things like Gina, um, which protects health, uh, protects you in terms of like medical health insurance, but does not protect against long-term care insurance or life insurance and use of genetic information. So, um, uh, so we educate in that process. And then it is the participant, you know, who decides to get the information. Uh, and then they can decide, of course, whether or not they uh, share that with their physician. We try to make that as easy as possible. And um, for instance, uh, there are ways they could, you know, put their information in and send a report. Uh, they can print a report a PDF. There's a provider version as well as a patient version um, that they can have. So we try to facilitate that if they want to. Another question. Historically, studies like these have been used to harm the same communities you're targeting. How are you assuaging these fears to bring these participants in? It goes back to engagement. It's really being authentic um, and listening. We get new ideas from people all the time. Uh, part of it is having researchers that are diverse well, and we talked about that earlier, um, to trying to make sure what happens. And then uh, we wanna make sure that we watch out for potentially stigmatizing research. That's a uh, when someone creates a new project, we ask a series of questions that helps guide someone through what might be potentially stigmatizing uh, an educational process, a series of questions that help flag for us, if it might be, we look at those in a different way. Uh, we also randomly audit and we search to things that could look potentially stigmatizing. And again, participants sometimes flag uh, these public uh, reports of research projects and says, hey, tell me a little bit more about this. Um, and then we, uh, that's a, a flag for our resource access board to think about that project with the researchers as well. A lot of what you're talking about is really the critical importance of the engagement with the participants. And one of the questions that's come in is that what efforts have occurred to ensure genomic health literacy for all of us participants? We have tools available in our program and we have taken the uh, reports that we produce and tested them with diverse audiences. And then there are the genetic counselors and we also monitor the quality of that. People can rate them uh, after the reaction. So far, all the feedback we've gotten has been incredibly positive um, across uh, diverse uh, populations that are interacting with our genetic counselors. So um, uh, we try to educate in the process. And you know, again, if someone wants to talk to somebody, even before they get a report back, they can. So we try to support people as much as we can through the whole process. You mentioned the Fitbits and had 15,000 participants, I guess, with Fitbit data, um, which are becoming popular for personal and health use. What are the data implications of using and transmitting this data? And I guess I would add on to that. What about the rest of us who might have the other devices who will be nameless? Um, any efforts to include other types of wearables that collect my health and pickleball 
calories and steps and things like that. You'll have to talk to me later and teach me about pickleball. Oh, it's great uh, sport. Uh, it's, it's, you know, I keep hearing it. Oh my gosh. In Bethesda too, How but... long are you here? <laughs> I got an extra paddle. Got your right, issues. Right. Let's go. See you tonight. Um, uh, uh, the, um, so, um, uh, you know, we uh, actually collect anything that comes in through Apple Health Kit as well. Um, uh, if a participant connects their device uh, in that way. So if they connect it, if they authorize Apple Health Kit data, we can get some things from other kinds of devices as well in that way. We have not harmonized, cleaned, and uh, de-identified that data to make it released yet. Um, so we've been focused uh, first on Fitbit. And this partially because we actually have a program where we're actively giving out Fitbits as well. So we're growing that population. It started with the sort of bring your own device, and then we're actually giving out active device uh, as well. I love the 10,000 steps though. I use it with my patients all the time. So I'm pulling the article and I'm going to print out the pictures and say, see, because mo many people tell me they're very active and I'll say, do you have a device? And they'll say, yes. They'll say, how many steps do you have? Oh, oh my God, Dr. Duba, 2,000 steps a day. And then I put up my device and I go, I had uh, 3,500 this morning playing pickleball and I'll get another uh, 7,000 tonight. And they go, oh. And I'll say it all helps. So I, I love your point though about every little bit helps. And, and that's why I try to assure my patients that inactive is not good, active is better all the time. So um, that, that's a really important message I think in primary care is that sedentary is bad. Any way you look at it, get the little thing under your desk kind of stuff. Okay, so next question. So what is the process of updating participant health information new diagnoses um, look like, especially for the pathogenicity of variants? Two things there that are really uh, important. One is we are a longitudinal study. Typically, uh, studies like Framingham, that's been done by bringing participants back and reassessing them you know, with a, uh, a visit. Uh, you know, a really important part is our electronic health records. Uh, a lot of my research work before all of us began was in that space and really showing that it's a very powerful uh, way to capture a lot of information to make genomic discoveries. discoveries. And Mayo's been a big part of that as well, of course. Um, uh, so we have ongoing collections of those kinds of data. We have ongoing surveys that we release to our participants. We are in the process of designing a reassessment module to catch up the key things. And because we have electronic health records, we're able to focus those kinds of questions around things that we don't get from the electronic health record, social de determinants of health, you know, the ideas of optimism and, and uh, stress and loneliness and like impact of COVID, those kinds of questions that, you know, we don't get other places. Um, uh, we can assess through uh, and spend that time, survey time, instead of asking, did you have diabetes and what was your last A1C and, you know, how often, do you, what medicines do you take? Because we get that some other way. Um, uh, so, so that's how we get the data to form a research resource. But in terms of participants, you bring up a great question. And clinically, actually, there's not a great answer for this. And, you know, when I get a lot of my, you know, I didn't order that many genetic tests as a, as a clinical provider. But when I did, you know, it's often a PDF that gets scanned into the medical record, right? That's not very actionable for future updates. In fact, it's not hard to find if you didn't know it was there, right? And so in our case, um, uh, you know, we're doing something that uh, hopefully becomes easier in all other circles as well. So as we have three clinical validation labs that call and interpret the variants, uh, there's one system electronically that, you know, harmonizes the report, uh, variant calls. And then that participant is recorded with that variant. And so if time that variant is reclassified, we essentially immediately know everyone who's been called with the prior variant. So we could update. So we know we're going to have to regularly do this. We don't quite know what the frequency and how, you know, what the exact process will be on this, but we will regularly think about this as variant interpretation changes over time, potentially, uh, you know, probably more from the unknown variants towards ones that might be pathogenic as opposed to pathogenic to benign. But, um, uh, but we do ed even educate participants that you'll get new results on these same tests over time. And we're actually going to test for more genes over time as we learn more about uh, what we can test. So uh, it will be an ongoing conversation with our participants. It'll be fascinating to find out as you build the diversity and what we learn about the non-white genomic variation to find out, are there other things we should be looking for? 
So one of the questions that came in is, um, will we be able to sign up for all of us in Rochester? Because one participant had to drive to Winona. So we're storing the samples, right? You're storing the samples. So when is our corner to, shop? Uh, you know, Mene and uh, Steve, they'll, they'll yeah. take, I'm just So uh, wh um, where's uh, our corner shop? I mean, because I got, I'm sending my patients there. I got to tell you. All of us yeah, is going. We that, that's awesome. Everyone, you know, it's, it's all of us is for all of us, right? So anyone can join, um, join all of us.org. Um, uh, and um, uh, with that process, you can also directly see where your nearest locations are. We can do saliva everywhere. Um, we have clinics, and you can see on the map where clinics are located. Um, and we're always thinking and where we can do more and create partnerships to get more closer to people where they're located. Well, and I would think that, you know, especially as you are looking to increase the diversity, I hate to tell you, as I look around the audience, this is not a really diverse place to put up shop. It's more diverse than when I came here 40 years ago, I can tell you that, but we got a ways to go. But I do want to highlight one thing is diversity is broad. So one of the things that we are after, um, uh, you know, broadly is people who live in rural places, people that live on farms and other sorts of, um, uh, you know, are not in a big city. And, and that's another population that's traditionally been underrepresented by medical research. So um, there are many kinds of diversity. And that is true. I mean, we have a very rural population here. And actually, there's a fair amount of diversity on the outlying areas for Rochester, um, people that come in traditionally for different types of work. Um, I haven't asked much about research, but research is clearly a huge area within the All of Us organization. So you mentioned that there's a group of Mayo people who are doing research, but how does somebody get in? How does that work? Somebody has a great question and wants to access this. How does that happen? You go to researchallofus.org and the process uh, guides you through how to sign up and go through that. Mayo um, is already an established institution with all of us. And so new researchers can come on uh, from Mayo and, and authenticate that they're a Mayo researcher and can really start doing new research in as short as a couple hours um, of going through the trainings and those procedures. So um, it really is easy to get on as a new researcher. We really wanted to facilitate that. And I'll just give you a quick anecdote. So uh, my last Vanderbilt PhD student, defended in, uh, I think it was March of 2021. And he presented his work about three years of you know, mining the electronic health record and finding, um, combining it with um, uh, some other publicly available resources to find medications that would lower um, uh, cholesterol and uh, predict it across you know, all medications and then clinically have a tool to do this um, in rapid fashion across the HR. And so the question was asked, not by me, um, uh, in the audience, well, you've done this at Vanderbilt and we see a lot of things coming out of Vanderbilt like this, you know, uh, can you do this anywhere else? And, and you know, we had been live for about a year at that point. And so I just said, hey, Patrick, why don't you do this in all of us? And he had never applied to all of us before. He uh, signed up for all of us and in a week sent me a figure that basically was the final figure, you know, with a few tweaks that was in his paper where he was able to replicate those results in all of us. So first application on the website to, you know, getting in, getting training, taking his, you know, hundreds of lines of code from the Vanderbilt system and then putting them into the all of us and going across, you know, 60 plus EHRs as opposed to one, um, and seeing a, a result which you know replicated what he found at Vanderbilt. Wow. So one of the questions came up, and I don't know how familiar you are with the tapestry study that's going on here, but one of our colleagues asked, is tapestry study the same as all of us? And if I signed up for tapestry, should I sign up for all of us? Is it the same? Is it redundant? How are they different? So uh, I have definitely heard of tapestry. I don't remember the details of tapestry, but what I do know for sure is they're not the same study. So um, uh, uh, that I do know. So uh, sign up for all of us as well um, as tapestry. And um, uh, we would welcome you and all of us, uh, just like I'm sure tapestry is, is very excited to have you also. Absolutely. So one of the questions that came up is the data set is obviously wide and rich. So, there will be a lot of interest from pharmaceutical companies, from data companies, from other companies. Is this going to be a problem? And how are you going to protect against 
this kind of or these groups perhaps from wanting to mine the data? Is it an issue? You know, we think more in general, more research in safe and protected ways that are designed to further discovery uh, around health um, will be, you know, good things in in general. And so, um, but what we do is people have to use the resource again within our model. We have a number of protections in it. So, you know, we are thinking about how we can broaden researcher access over time in a safe, secure way that is engaging with our participants and and can communicate well um, what they do. Um, uh, You know, it's, uh, I like using the example and thinking about uh, the UK Biobank is a, it completely uh, is a very open resource for approved researchers. And we see uh, pharmaceutical companies that have, um, you know, uh, greenlit or, or stopped medication development, you know, based on drug targets that they're finding in a essentially non-diverse population. And so I think there's a real value to creating a resource that, you know, can understand the pharmacogenetics in our diverse population, can just serve drug targets, just like the latest, you know, PCSK9 inhibitors found in a small population of individuals, African Americans in Dallas, um, uh, that's basically not really present in um, uh, people like me. And so, so how do we, um, uh, you know, sort of do that in that safe communicative fashion that brings, you know, uh, discoveries that will benefit science and benefit people of all backgrounds uh, equitably. So combining genomic data, electronic health record data, and patient reported data has to be complex, but important in painting a holistic picture. So how is this work going on with all of us? You know, we are building a platform. Our job is to pull those data together, uh, harmonize them, put them in common data models, make them accessible, build tools for researchers to use them. And then it's really uh, up to researchers to bring hypotheses. You know, we will get more science done uh, by more diverse people with more diverse questions. by making that available than trying to centrally resource it. And so our job has always been to build a platform and have scientists come in and do that research, but to collect those different data streams. I didn't talk about the biospecimens we captured, but it feels like this question gets a little bit to that. So we get uh, DNA, which we talked a lot about, uh, RNA, cell-free DNA. So that's you know free-floating DNA, which um, uh, can potentially be used for all sorts of things like diagnosis of uh, potential cancers in the future. Um, uh, we get uh, serum and plasma and urine. And so uh, things like NPH, our nutrition for precision health, are also capturing microbiome data, uh, metabolomics data. You know, we could generate other data sets and we'll generate other data sets over time, which will provide another way of resourcing the data. We need to get environmental data is one of the things we really focused on expanding. And so these different ways of answering and really thinking about the different dimensions around uh, individualized health. And, and it's not just genetics. It's not just, you know, sort of what's in your EMR. It's all these other things. Because most of the time it's, of course, fortunately, um, not in the healthcare system. And so we want to understand those things. And we want to understand not just about disease, but a health trajectory. And I think those will be important parts of the question as well. Quick question. How were sex and gender information collected? And will the gender sex be provided in all of us? So we have a multi-part question that gets at sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, we have worked with groups like PrideNet to really think of what these uh, questions should be. And of course, with all of our questions, we ask participants, make sure they understand, make sure these are you know, received well, that we're asking the right questions. And so that's, that's how our questions have been designed. And we've actually changed them a little bit since they uh, started. Those data are available in the workbench. Uh, you can look through them. Uh, you can actually, uh, anyone can just see what they look like right now uh, without login, data browser, um, dot researchallofus.org. Um, you can even look at it on your phone and you can look at like the breakdowns on how people answer those questions um, see what the question answers are and things like that. So self-reported data. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, self-reported data is, I guess, maybe the key part of that. Yes. Okay. So do you anticipate long-term results will help direct health policy in the United States? I hope so. And wouldn't it be great if um, USPSTF uh, uh, guidelines Uh, started regularly thinking about real world data from things like all of us, maybe even, you know, those were active kind of investigations as part of this. So um, uh, yes, I I certainly hope that data and discoveries that are made in all of us help inform future um, uh, things and, and 
funding and guidelines and everything else about what we pay for and healthcare, et cetera. This is a longitudinal study. How long are you going to follow participants and how are you going to figure out what happens? How will death information be collected? Well, you know, the last time I was asked this on stage, uh, Framingham was 74 years old. So I said 75 years. Love it. At least. So that's you know, do I, you part. What's that? Yeah. So that's yeah, do you exactly. part. So, you know, I want this program to keep going. I don't really see it. I don't see any reason necessarily to end it and um, to, to just follow people over time. And, um, uh, you know, we will, uh, we're going to continue to grow with our resources, one of which, of course, will be linking to death and disease um, to try to bring those data in. So um, uh, there's active, an active uh, an award that's in consideration if you looked at our website that's actually building on things and trying to you know, bring in more data like that. So what do you think is the biggest value to researchers? And then do you use research, research or feedback to improve the data set and workbench tools? We do. Um, we have uh, weekly office hours that uh, researchers uh, call into, and we get all sorts of feedback from that. You can, uh, as you're using the workbench, there's a place to provide feedback at any point uh, in the workbench and tell us the things that you find. We do, I mean, people find things all the time. You know, I'm a real believer in used resources get better. So instead of uh, trying to get everything perfect, and then release, you know, we get things out there kind of quick. I mean, if you look at other, some other platforms out there, you know, they release data when the cohort's been recruited or, you know, a longer period of time. And, you know, we released in 2020, uh, our first resource two years after our national launch. And so we want to keep that kind of pace up with things. Of course, we're going to be really good about things like uh, doing the privacy uh, technology and across of it, but we're going to release all the lab data we have um, uh, after some initial harmonization steps, even though some are going to be really clean and some of them are going to be much noisier. And over time, we'll get that more noise, uh, you know, the, the noisier ones cleaner and the participant community, the researcher participant community, I should say, will help clean that for us. And then you can share notebooks. That's a great thing too, is as people develop algorithms, those algorithms can be put in our, our library of tutorial uh, workspaces and they can be shared. We can adopt centrally different algorithms people could develop. And so the idea is the, petition, the, the resource by being used will continue to get better and more usable. Well, I think you've answered this at least partially, but will insurers and payers have access to information and could this impact what conditions would be covered for patients in the future? Uh, insurers and payers have no access to any individual uh, information from the program. Everything in the research researcher workbench is uh, has identifiers removed, and so you're always using it from a you know de-identified viewpoint. Um, uh, and so you know no one can and 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 trying to re-identify someone is one of those things that's strictly prohibited um, in the agreement. And again, it's all within our platform, so you know. Uh, we can audit a workspace at any time. Um, uh, we can actually, we're actually looking at ways of computationally looking for patterns that could look like someone trying to re-identify someone. We have um, uh, uh, rules about how you report the information you discover as well. So all those things lead to you know, protection of identity and make it really um, not possible for an insurance company to know something about an individual unless, unless they wanna tell the insurance company. We're running short on time, but I think my last question is, Dr. Denny, I'm your patient. So what's the downside for me to join all of us? There's no downside, of course. <laughs> it's all upside. On that, I think I'd like to thank you so very much. I'm glad I get off easy. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it looks like I've exhausted the questions here that I can read or understand. Um, I want to thank you very much on behalf of all of us for the Center for Individualized Medicine for coming to Rochester. We uh, decided not to have a snowstorm for you. So you didn't have to drive in some god awful weather. And uh, thank you for participating today. And thank you so much for participating in our Genes and Your Health podcast. Well, thank you very much. Real pleasure to be here. Thank you.